Thank you very much for letting me be here today. I'm really excited, and this is the stuff that gets me going, right? The, that sort of building, that's why I'm in this business. I love to build. I'm, I was built to build. And so let's talk about that a little bit, because as I went from building, being a project manager, to becoming a director of BIM and a director of virtual design and construction, there was a phrase that stuck with me. Cool is a terrible business plan. We don't do any of this because it's cool. We do this because there's supposed to be a building like that one we just saw when we're done. And it's supposed to be smooth and easy and the client's supposed to think it's a great way all the way through. So that's what we're here as a team to do. So what change really matters and what do we have to do to make that happen? So we all know that change is really easy. If you're looking at it from a historic standpoint, right? You look back, oh yeah, that's how they got from those carriages to those cars, right? And so how do we deal with this change? What has to change and what gets to stay the way it is? That's what we have to be figuring out. And so if you think about that transition from carriages to cars, right? Some stuff really changed a lot. I mean, a very different type of fuel, right? And a little bit of different output from the fuel. You put more fuel, yeah, you get different stuff out. But um, training had to change. The, the speed of everything happening was probably the biggest thing that changed. The rules of the road. Right? You see historic pictures of cars and, and horses and carriages on the road together. How did they manage that? Right, And then maintenance. But some of it just stays the same. It's all transportation. It's all wheels. It's all drivers and shipments. It's customers. That's what it comes back down to. A lot of that doesn't change. So let's apply that to what we're looking at and what's going to be happening with us. It's still going to be design. We're still using computers. There's still people, it still has to be built, and there's still customers. All of that has still got to take place. But some of that other fuel training speed, there's some changes taking place there. So we're going to walk through five of those areas of the things that I have seen as I've dealt with all these architects and engineers on these 300 plus projects and all the stuff we've done. What things are really making a difference for those that excel versus those that aren't? And many of you in this room have probably already made some, if not all, of these changes. But chances are your consultants and the other people you're working with might not have. And I want to put these changes in distinct terms so you can take this forward so we can be moving our industry and performing better as we go. So different but the same, CAD to BIM, right? It was, it's still a design, but there was a lot of differences. Well, what if that's not completely all of it? BIM, some people treat BIM more like it's on the CAD side. And they still, they're, they're focused on the drawings. And so what about this focus to virtual design and construction? Virtually building the building like we just saw in some of those images. And so what I think is, is we end up with them somewhere in the middle as we're making this transition from CAD to a virtual design and construction world. And we get some of these old practices mixed in with new tech and they can catch us because none of us want to end up in a situation like this, right? This is not what we're after, okay? So we want to figure out how to do that. So I, you're going to see this picture kind of in there in a few little spots where we've got mixed practices that probably just aren't quite what we're after. And I want to identify those so you make sure you and your consultants don't get caught in those situations. So we're going to walk through these, the five areas on the left and talk about each one of them a little bit different as we go through. So what to change? Our inputs and our outputs. Drawings versus models. I see that all the time everywhere that I go. So let's dive into this just a little bit. Now, I realize we've got 204 countries here today, and all my experience is US-based from the United States. And so it's all going to be based on that. But the principle and the concept that we have to get from drawings to construction, and somewhere in there, we need the fabrication information. What is actually being fabricated? because it's too expensive to have everything be custom on a project. We have to know what the stock items are. And so in the past, what we did is we had drawings, and then we had the shop drawing process in the US, and then we go to construction. Okay? Now, that's the old practice. And I still see people do that because they just throw a model in there. Now, everyone in this room knows what ArchiCAD is, and so they're up above the others. They're not necessarily doing it this poorly, but I still see that. They pay someone, they do a drawing, and then they pay someone, and you end up double twice. They do the design, and then they pay someone to create a model. OK? 
Okay? Now, this falls apart every time as soon as they get here. Because then we start coordinating it, like you just saw in those images. Got all that duct work and all the steel and everything figured out where it goes. And they coordinate all that in a model. And then what happens? They put some disclaimer on it, and none of that information that from the model ever gets back up into the drawings. And what are they actually building from? They fall down there all the time. And so if somebody's telling you that BIM costs more, like a consultant or somebody you're working with, they're probably doing it this type of wrong. And you can tell them to get the horse out in front of the car and just use the car like they're supposed to. Okay? So this is what we should be doing. You should be creating design models. And you coordinate those models with consultants, with the fabricators, right? Actually getting that steel fabrication model back in there. Because here, who in this room has had a gusset plate end up ruining parts of their design? Right? Okay, where did that come from? Well, it kind of holds the building up, right? And I've... I've had to go back through and cut out 200 gusset plates and shorten them all up because it wasn't seen, because it wasn't in the model the way it should have been. But now we're figuring that out, and we're smarter. So this is what we want. And then, if we need drawings, we'll produce some drawings. Sometimes we need them for, for you know, reviews by authority heavy jurisdiction, for permits, or for someone to use. But we really, the drawings should be a byproduct. And they're a derivative of the model. We just do them when we need them. Now. One of the litmus tests that I love, if I can get someone to do this, I know they've got it down. They've created a model, and the drawings are then a derivative from the model. And if they're comfortable with overlaying it in BIMX and having all those right on top of each other, they're on the right road. But if you talk to them, hey, let's overlay your drawings on the, on the model, and let's look at that in depth and see how that matches up, and they get nervous, then they're using old practices, and they're probably cheating their drawing somewhere by going in and putting some lines on top of it that, that really aren't needed. Um, so that was part of the inputs. We have to change how we're building it. Now, let's talk about training. We have a standard slide that I have to say, OK, we have to teach people how to use the new software. Everybody knows that. We're going to go past that really quick. That's easy. You just go on YouTube, and there's tons of stuff to learn how to do that. There's deeper training that really starts to make a difference. So checking the quality of models. I see this as a huge differentiator between the firms that are excelling and the firms that are falling behind. Checking a model. It seems like it'd be simple, but I see stuff like this all the time. In drawings, this was fine. In drawings, this footing was great. This footing was great. Everything looked fine in the drawings. But this was a hard project, and you can understand why. You had structural footings being done by one engineer, and you had equipment footings being done by another engineer. And every place those two footings touched each other, there was a serious set of questions of what was going to take place. Two different structural firms trying to combine footings together. And in this instance, what we found in the model was that these piers were about a meter below the footing. Now, if we're actually building from the model, this doesn't work because they drive piers. And what do you do here? So there was a two-hour conversation about what's taking place here. What had happened is the structural firms, they were still in a mindset that they thought they were creating drawings. And we had to try to explain to them, you are planning the design of the building. And so get out of this drawing concept, and let's get into where we should be. So another thing we need to change is how we deliver the models to the users. How are they actually going to use them? And I love this picture of the building owner with his assistant walking outside with a laptop and holding it up to try to look at the building. Now, we get a lot better now. We have the tablets. There's a lot more things going on. But still, that owner is probably going to need some training on how to get into your model and really look at it. And once you start getting that owner engaged and others engaged, then it starts to make a lot of difference. And then more people are finding the errors, and you might not depend on that little student to find the error in front of everybody using the virtual reality we just saw. We want to find those sooner. So. And then exchanging models is something that starts to make a big difference in what we're changing and training. So if, okay, if we start this off with a model-based design like we talked about, and we start exchanging models, usually the architect leads, civil engineer, put, the, put it on the site. So now we've got two models. Now we can set an origin point, and we can start to federate these models. So we start to pull them together. Now, whatever software we're doing, my preference is Celebri. But there's lots of other options out there. We've got to get our structure pulled in. We've got to get our mechanical systems, electrical, plumbing, sprinkler, security, 
everything else pulled in, whatever else, kitchen, whatever their designs that you need to have, all pulled into that federated model. And this becomes our design requirements. But we're only part way there because we still have to build this building. And so there's a lot of training to take place to get this whole other side of what actual means and methods are going to come into this. So now, derived from the architectural, fabrication for curtain wall, flooring, fabrication for steel, rebar, the joists, is it all actually going to fit? Now, I've seen that multiple times on the high-rise hotels and condos we've done where the rebar and post-tension cables just didn't fit in front of the elevator shaft. They just, there's not enough space in the floor to do it. And I would like to find that out during the design process rather than the construction process when there's 50 guys up there laying rebar. Okay, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, landscaping, parking, kitchen, whatever else there is, whatever com key components are going into this building, they ought to be modeled and pulled in together and all federated together, including the owner furnished equipment. I don't know how many times I've had an x-ray machine or something else end up coming in and we routed up all the electrical over here and the x-ray machine wants the electrical over here. And what do you do? You chip all the floor up and you reroute it. We ought to be finding those things sooner and better. So that starts to become not only BIM, but virtual design and construction because we're coordinating it all the way through the process. So now if we're starting to do that, now we can really start to use the models to build from. So now instead of using drawings to go out there and lay out this project, we should be looking at a robotic total station where we're picking points directly from our model and it's putting a green dot where that thing's supposed to go. That makes us even better at what we do. So all of those things start to come together, but one way to really make it happen that I find highly beneficial is cross-training. Okay? Architects understanding what the contractor needs and a contractor understanding what the architect needs. So here is my first adventure at cross-training. That is the kitchen that I designed in Archicad and then over actually went out and built. And you'll notice that this was my first pass, so some of the stuff didn't go very well. Like you'll notice this hood right here doesn't look like anything they got put in there. The CEO said, no, we're not doing that. And I do what she says. Um, and so <laughs> there was a few of those other instances as well, right? But this has helped me start to learn visualization, right? And the first time through, I realized, hey, the visualization, the encounter changed, all these things changed. But I didn't realize that I was supposed to be going back in the model and fixing that stuff as we went. But now I've learned that, and so it's better. And that cross-training went a long way because I took it from design clear to construction myself. And now I do that with all of my projects. My wife wants a Murphy bed. I build her a Murphy bed. I completely design it in ARCHICAD, and then I turn around and I cut all the two by fours and I fabricate it. But those little projects, they start to get that point across that there really isn't a project that is too small for BIM. Right? And don't let anybody tell you that. Oh, that project's too small. We don't need it. No. The smaller ones, you faster turn around. You learn more. You get a cycle out of the way. And you're better off for having done it when you're done. So now because of the speed of construction and design is changing, I'm sure many of you have felt that pressure. They want your design faster and they want it more thorough and everything. It's because the software lets us do that. Now, some of you might have seen this before. Some of you might not have. It's called the McLeamy curve. The principal concept behind it is that as you go through your design process, your ability to change that design is diminishing all the way across that process. And as you go across there, the cost of making that design change is going up. Now those cross somewhere during the, what we would call the construction documentation phase from the past. But that is when the majority of work used to be done when we had to do this with strict CAD or hand drawing and things like that. When if we can serve our clients by making more decisions earlier and better decisions, we have the ability to change. It doesn't cost them as much to change. And we are changing the very nature of the success of our deliverables. What enables this to happen? VDC or BIM. Now, an interesting thing, some of you might have noticed this, but I got to point this out to four or five firms over the couple of years. This also means that your billing cycle has to change. Instead of 20, 20, 40, 20, you've got to bill about 20% a whole phase earlier because you have to put more effort in up front. Those are the little things that make a difference. 
Uh, the reason I tell you this is because we had one particular experience with BIM very first getting started where they were projecting their cost of design and they realized they were putting all this effort in here and they thought that they were going to blow the budget. And so they quit doing BIM and they went back to their CAD and then they had to go through this hump again. And yes, they blew their budget, but they didn't tell us about it. So when it came time to construction, it blew our budget too. Nobody was happy except the owner, um, which was a good place to be. So in order to make that happen, more effort up front means you have to be exchanging information sooner. Not just waiting at these certain phases, be getting all of the consultants, be getting the fabricators, be getting the contractors, all of them, earlier participation, getting their information pulled into your models and cycling through that faster and faster. That's how you deliver the whole design faster is by not being so incremental. Be smaller steps at a time so that no one heads in the wrong direction at any given time. So, earlier information from the client. More schematic layouts, adding the new areas, different zones by different colors. We've seen that this morning as well. Okay. Being able to get better decisions from the clients. Virtually modeling a hotel room so they can actually see what it looks like with the actual samples. This is people going out and taking pictures of throw pillows and then creating virtual reality based on that exact throw pillow. Okay. Um, earlier input from contractors, starting the class detection sooner makes a big difference. Get that in there, get that going. Don't be waiting till after, we're, hey, we're so far along. Start getting those models in faster, getting that class run, okay? And then the models from the fabricators, so much of this is going towards a Kobe environment where the owner wants all their manufacturer information and you can't get that until the manufacturer actually comes and puts it in. Now, of course, yes, as an architect or an engineer, you could go type all that in, but that's a highly inefficient way to do it. You want to get those models from the fabricator with that information already embedded in it when you go. So along with that, the rules of the road change, okay? Okay, the contracts. I, I keep getting this stuff and it's so out of date, right? There is no warranty express implied about the merchantly fitness of the models. Why aren't we sharing these models? That's where all the information is. I don't know why I see this week after week, and I've seen some that are much worse and some that are much better. Okay? Get some model-based contract language. The consensus docs, 301, 2011 versions, the sweetest thing I see out there. I've seen people spend $10,000 on lawyers to figure out what they could have just gone and picked up for like 900 bucks. Um, when you're exchanging models, use the level of development spec, right? Be talking about what LOD people are going to be at for different levels and what they're going to be doing. Okay? You have the pictures to do it. This is a huge benefit to everybody. What is LOD 300 versus 400 in a picture of it? And then my rule for the rules of the road for what models to get from my fabricators, if it's a shop drawing or a cut sheet or a coordination drawing, that should be in a model format from the trade it's required from. Okay, that's what we need to be doing. So now the last step, and I already alluded to this, don't be pulling your horse around when you're doing this all the wrong way with your models and you're not updating them, coming back in at the end and design changes and field changes, that's not what we should be doing, okay? What you should be doing is taking and updating your models as you go. So you're putting the design changes in the model, you're putting the field changes in the model, into the shop drawings, into the shop models. And then when you get to the end of the job, all you have to do is take those models and those drawings that are derived from the models and you just roll them out and deliver them to the owner at the end. Now you don't have any more what's called an as-built set. You have record models and fabrication models, and you have to educate an owner on that. Because designers don't want to take liability for the fabrication models, and fabricators are not designers. So you end up with two sets, but it's much better set of information for your client when you're done. So all these things together, okay, you have to choose your destiny. Are you going to be stuck in the middle with mixed practices where you're pulling out the horse with the car? Or are you going to be enjoying this driving experience? And more importantly, when you're enjoying this driving experience, are you going to be preparing yourself for the future of what's coming? Because it is changing faster and faster, and the technology is moving on us, and we have to be ready for what's coming here tomorrow. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.